Good evening to uh, Sunday Night Alive, and we have a very special guest this evening, but there's a few things I have to talk about. During the past week, the Holy Father, as you know, was visiting in England and in Scotland. He was greeted by huge crowds of people. Many of them were not Catholic. He was received, received with great enthusiasm. I spoke to our own brothers who were in England, and they told me the great reception at the beatification of Cardinal Newman. Sad to say, disgracefully, disgracefully, that the New York Times on September 19th International edition, has an article about the Pope facing protests in London. Pope expresses sorrow over child abuse. Now, indeed that is true, but there is nothing about the tremendous reception of the Holy Father in, in, in England. They found uh, a, a, a person, a, this, uh, one of the people demonstrating, carries uh, Ratzinger, you're not welcome. Stop P preaching hatred against gay people. Reactionary Ratzinger. This is on the front stage of the New York Times. Now, is this the, is this the best they can do? Nothing to the recognition of the tremendous popular reception that the Holy Father received. And my own brothers in England were telling me about this on the phone today. Uh, on top of that, Associated Press put a very similar article in many, many newspapers around the country with another picture. Shame on Associated Press. Uh, are they joining in to the hostility to the Pope and to the Catholic Church that we also find not only in the Times, but in a number of large newspapers in this country? Uh, can I suggest to you that you write to the New York Times, especially if you're a New Yorker, 628th Avenue, New York 10018. And uh, if you want to call them up, 212-556-1234. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you want to write to Associated Press, uh, you can call them, 212-621-1500. Their headquarters are on 450 West 33rd Street and are very easy uh, and mail place, 10001. But I would hope that you would speak up New Yorkers Against the Times, Associated Press. And in a few weeks, I'm going to do a whole broadcast one evening on the hostility of the, um, the media and the United States against religion, but particularly against the Catholic Church, and more especially against the Pope. They should be ashamed. And if you read the articles when they attack the Pope, you have big, big headlines. Then you read the article. It's a mouse. 
<laughs> it's a mouse. The Pope didn't even know the person they were talking about, and it was one person. But if you read it, the, the, the end of the world. Shame. Shame on the New York Times. Most of my life I read the New York Times, and I still read it by borrowing it from other people because I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> so shame, shame on their attack on the Pope. And uh, just look in England and in Scotland, the tremendous reaction positive to the Holy Father. And what have we got? The newspapers, the media, they are biased and bigots against the Catholic Church and its moral teachings. Now, <clears throat> I'm a little bit annoyed. All right, now we have a very peaceful <laughs> visitor tonight, so I have to turn the machine over <laughs> and smile. I'm here with one of my dear friends for many years, Father Richard Holung. Father Holung is the founder of the Missionaries of the Poor down in uh, Jamaica, and with Father is this evening is Father Charles, who is also a missionary of the poor, and uh, he's come with him together, and we're very honored to have you here this Thank evening. Thank you, Father. Father. God bless. And, yes. uh, uh, brother, Father, tell us again, you are from? I come from India. India. Yes. Uh, Pondicherry. Pondicherry, right. A place where they speak French. Right? Yes, they do. Yes. And, uh, and the missionaries of charity come from all over the world, right? Uh, yes. Many, many. How yeah. many missionaries of, of the poor are there? There are about 550, Father. 550. Uh, yes. Mostly brothers and a Mostly few priests. Mostly brothers. Yes. And uh, isn't that a wonderful... And how many years? It's been 28 years. 28 yes. years. And Father was uh, formerly a member of the Jesuits. That's right. Where did yes. you teach? I taught for a little while uh, at Boston College. Boston College. And a little while, I, I had just a short stint at Scranton University, and then University of the West Indies in Jamaica, and St. George's College. Uh huh. Yes. Now, you told me years ago, but how did you come to make this decision of leaving the Society of Jesus? Well, part of it was that uh, there was lack of clarity at a certain point in the Society of Jesus as to who we are and where we're going. And uh, in addition to that, uh, very uh, heart-wrenching experiences of the poor in Jamaica, where we had um, so many people lying on the streets, sick, dying, and also that, that great event when, terrible event actually, which was transformed into a great event, positively uh, by the hands of the Lord. At even tide, where 155 women were burnt out in a condemned building that yes. that housed these women. Uh, and they were locked in. They, they were locked in, and it, they, it's a government building. So I reacted to it and said right away, uh, somehow the Lord doesn't want this. Somehow something has got to be done. And uh, I just acted in faith and said, you know, we'll rebuild a building. No matter how it's done, it will be done. So we went around taking photographs, um, showing, you know, <laughs> women um, very often just naked, sleeping on bed springs that were broken. Uh, men that you would see um, having no food at all for four or five days. Um, little children being attacked by rats their earlobes bitten, their lips bitten. Um, and it, it moved me to the point where my conscience said I could not continue the way I, 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 I was going as a priest. And the Lord called me and I just simply said, yes, Lord, I don't know how it will be done, but it will be done. And I, I did my best. And thereafter, um, a couple men came and joined in the effort. We just went and volunteered, as well as we worked in the prisons, where youngsters again were uh, being locked up for life. Uh, it was called the Gun Court Act in Jamaica. And uh, 
youngsters who lived in the ghetto and in the yard, there might have been somebody with a gun, uh, uh, was cause for the whole yard to be locked up. But it was very political. Um, the, the, the ruling party wanting to control the votes by terrorizing uh, a lot of the youngsters from the uh, opposition party. And so we got involved in that also and called for the rights of the young people. Again, the press reacted, and uh, it became a big cause. And uh, God turned the whole thing around when I was, uh, I, I was brought to, uh, to face the press. I had no idea what it was all about. And the, the press reacted when I was told that I was a traitor to my country because uh, rather than conducting campaigns for, for tourism in Jamaica, I was showing that Jamaica had great suffering and injustices. And uh, it blew the lid open, and the, the press really got behind it uh, in this instance and defended us. And so there, uh, that was the incident that really sparked the founding of Missionaries of the Poor. And I remember this when I was around. Yeah. I was in Jamaica, and uh, I met you. And uh, in fact, I was invited by you to right. Jamaica. Yeah. And uh, you could not believe in what sounded like a paradise, because people went on their vacation, that it could be such abominable poverty. Uh, you could see well, one place was quite beautiful, and Two miles away, it was terribly, terribly dark. Uh, and uh, when you came there, you're not telling people so clearly, but they were threatening your life. Yeah. Yes. And the first few missionaries of the poor came. They were also threatened. And what happened? Well, um, we kept on, and uh, we, we just persevered. Father, at the beginning, there were no Catholics because Jamaica is only 2% Catholics. And people were very hostile to the church. Um, uh, you'll find in English-speaking countries where the church might have been Catholic, the, uh, we were shut down by the, by the, by the English and, and persecuted. But um, there were practically nobody at all who would come to the, uh, to the missionaries. And we started going through the streets among the ghetto people, and uh, they began to hear about the Catholic Church. People thought we were not Christians. And um, then they began to say, but they do derive from the Bible. And they began to get together with us for prayer. And now, Father, if you come to the chapel, it's jam-packed. Um, just this past Easter, for instance, we have had about 100 a hundred baptisms, and uh, and the the faith is growing. A lot of young people are opening up and so forth. I think based on the beatitudes and the works of the poor. And what I also remember, <clears throat> some fundamentalist, not Christians, accused you of doing good works. Remember that? <laughs> You're going to lose your soul because they said that about Mother yeah, Teresa, yeah, too. Yeah, yes. She's going to hell because she does good works. Yes, well, figure well, that one out. They said you're only doing social work and you're, you're a priest and so forth. That, what sort of foolishness is that? Yeah. But I think their hearts knew something else. And then we really had some wonderful people, uh, evangelicals, come around. And they said, but this is the living word. This is the living gospel. And uh, they've been very open. The church began to really open up at that level. Well, uh, the, uh, there's much to tell us about how you proceeded. And we have brother here, father, with us this evening, Father Charles. He's one of the examples uh, of the effect of your uh, work. B -b -b brother has come all the way from India. Right? Yes, yes, and, Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have uh, missionaries of the poor all over the world. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I joined 19 years ago. I was doing my uh, college studies in, um, in India. And um, 
I met the brothers and the priests who came from uh, Jamaica to visit with us. Um, and I was actually not intending to join any religious life. I was going through my studies to get a job and move ahead in, in life. But when I met them, I almost felt like maybe this is what the Lord wanted me to do. And um, I took a, uh, the courage to leave what I was doing, discontinued my studies, and then went to the brothers uh, in India. And the amazing um, experience I had was this, that, you know, India is poor, and um, you have poverty everywhere. And almost you can be calloused um, with the poverty. And so uh, that was the first time when I joined the brothers, I heard a priest telling me, uh, if you want to continue to be a missionary of the poor, you must see Christ in the poor. I remember writing up a letter to my parents and saying, this priest is asking me to see Christ in the poor. Nobody has told me ever like that. And it was difficult. But when I met the, the leper for the first time and tried to dress his wounds and met him, it was an amazing experience I had. That changed my life. Changed your life. We have to have a little break, so we'll be back in two minutes. And I hope you're getting ready some ideas for questions and things to say. We'll be back in two minutes. guess, as our audience is looking, who are all of these religious in the front row? So I'll start with Father Benedict Worry, who is a Benedictine monk from Del Barton, New Jersey, uh, next to is one of my former students uh, years ago, Father Fred Monsis Monsignor Franciscini, who's a pastor in Staten Island. And then next is Father John Vianney, who is a Cistercian from Taiwan. Is that? Yeah, Vietnam. Vietnam. So, yes. And Father was a prisoner for 18 years and managed to survive. That's wonderful, Father. Right, let's, let's give Father a little. <laughs> and then fly on the end there is my good confrere, Father Andrew Apostoli. We started our new community with six other friars, and uh, uh, we're still around. <laughs> they haven't killed us yet. <laughs> now, uh, uh, way in the back is Brother Simon, who's taking care of me, very kindly, one of our brothers. Now, uh, two things I think we want to talk about. One is about your community, what its life, how it comes along. And the other is what the work has done as you got started trying everything desperately poor. And I remember you telling me this. And Jamaica has changed a yes. good deal since that time. And not only because of the missionaries of the poor, but because of the example of the missionaries of poor got other people to believe that this is taking care of Christ. Father, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work there, what the missionaries are doing. The, uh, we started off uh, with a home called Faith Center. The, we had taken some, some of the people from the home. Uh, just on the very same land there was a number of other homes that we were afraid would get burnt or, or, or destroyed in one way or another. So we took a number of the Down syndrome homeless and we started building with them. And we quickly saw that there were more and more and more people coming to us. Um, it was a bit frightening because we didn't know what we were doing. All we had were really our hearts. 
and Christ, our faith in Christ, that uh, it would get done because it is his will. Um, quickly, a home that was made really just for about 30 people became a home for about 50 people. Then it went on to 70 people. And at this moment, no, it's 95 people at Faith Center. Um, and it, it's surprising because uh, we just found people were supporting us. We have a fourth floor of free service, Father. A what? A free service to oh, the yes, poor. Yes. So that nothing is charged. And part of it is that we take no money from the government. This way we can have our own policies. We, we wouldn't have the enforcement of, for instance, uh, um, artificial contraception or any of these devices. So we wanted that freedom. And uh, one home, then the second home was for women. Uh, it was meant to be for 40. At the moment, it is now 95 people sleeping there. Many of them, we just set out mattresses between the, the bunk beds. If you recall, we, we yes. sleep in bunk beds. And uh, we just set them out in the pathways and so forth. And it's, it now has about 90, 95 people there. Um, then we built another home called the Lord's Place. We found out that there was a great need for, for free service to people with HIV AIDS. And we have had some five or 600 people pass through our hands uh, in, the, in, in that home. And there we have, I think, about 180 to 200 people. Then we started uh, a home called Bethlehem for little children who are blind or deaf or mute or crippled or uh, they have hydrocephalic. And uh, we took them in. They, they were not adoptable. Many people didn't want to have these children uh, in their families. <coughs> so we took the ones who were the discarded ones. And that home now has uh, 60 or 70, 70 kids. But beautifully, evangelization began and people from all over the ghettos from far and wide would come in just to worship and to find out who are these Catholics and it was amazing um, the curiosity grew and grew and grew so that right now we, 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 we don't have enough space to pack them in then after that uh, we, we built a home called Good Shepherd which was me meant for 20 people. Uh, Mother, Mother Teresa's sisters were there, but they gave up that building. And uh, it was meant for 20, it's now 70 people. <laughs> and uh, so we, we continue to increase that way. Then we have now built a home in the mountains at our retreat center uh, for 40 more children. And these are, again, uh, children who are crippled, but who have become a little bit more, more mature. I remember when I was visiting the large number of children struggling with physical uh, deformities and uh -huh. difficulties, mm -hmm. limitations, but it was very beautiful how happy and peaceful they were. I had a little boy, you probably remember him, he had a huge growth. Jason. Jason, Jason yes. Uh -huh. And this poor little fellow, couldn't, his eye practically disappeared. And I felt so sad, but he was happy. He mm -hmm. he could with this half of a face. Yes. And uh -huh. the, and uh, the the missionaries taking him in, and now he's been there ten years, I guess. Yes, at least. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I'm sure all of you are wondering how you could write to join in to help the missionaries of the poor. And uh, we have a mailbox for them here in Atlanta, Georgia, for the missionaries. Box 29893, 29893 in Atlanta, Georgia, 30359. And I'm going to ask the uh, uh, people running our stuff here tonight, put that up but after we have our next break, so you would be able to write to the missionaries of the poor and be part of this work. Uh, now, 
The other side, brother, maybe, father, you could tell us, what about the religious life? Father started all by himself. How did you start to make it into a religious community? I think young people like challenges, and I can speak for myself, that I wanted to do something very challenging, but also at the same time purposeful, meaningful, that um, not only just concerned about myself, but something that, uh, that is about, cares about others. And I was also looking for a faith that is not just up in the air, just, you know, hanging out there, but something that can connect to reality and face up to uh, changing people's lives, um, whether it is physically or spiritually. And I thought Missionaries of the Poor had both, where you contact the suffering humanity, um, the brokenness of uh, people and their lives, their lifestyle, no education, children on the street, begging, um, broken homes. And I thought missionaries of the poor had the charism to go into homes, fix their lives. I mean, we didn't have all the answers for their problems, but the beauty of missionaries of the poor was that they were there present among the poor. And that moved my life to say, I must be part of this community. And we were, when we started off, when I was there, we were just 21 of us in 1992 when I came to Jamaica. And um, I felt the gospel was lived, like the Beatitudes, or where Jesus talks about, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was homeless, you welcomed me. And I felt all of that literally lived every day. For example, the brothers rise at 5.30 um, in the morning, which is our schedule. We have um, about uh, an hour and a half prayers. We are, we are strict about our prayer life because I think we, it gives us strength to carry out the daily works. And uh, brothers go from morning, like about 8 o'clock in the morning, right up to 6 in the evening, working among the poor, both in the homes and outside the shelters in the ghettos. And it, it was a real way of laying down one's life, both for the humanity and at the same time serving God, uh, sometimes whom we do not see. And so it was really refreshing for me at a very young age, although I might look like 19 now, I have been in the community for 19 years, um, it's, it's quite a, an active life of touching the poor, the broken ones, at the same time meeting Christ uh, in all of them. And I thought it's a very purposeful way of living. And the church in, in Jamaica, the, the bishop, who I believe also is a Jesuit, the archbishop, uh, uh, they have cooperated, permitted it to go on and give you the necessary approval because it's something very different. You know, St. Francis ran into the same thing. You know, they were doing something so unusual that they had to go to the Pope. The Pope protected them. But the people thought they were heretics because they were trying to follow the gospel. Right. It, Especially in the Brotherhood, uh, Father Benedict, uh, people didn't really understand the Brotherhood at all. And still uh, in Catholic countries where, where, where uh, there are many priests and the church is well established, the Brotherhood is looked at as definitely inferior to the priesthood. And uh, in, in, in terms of clerical standing, it is so. But in terms of sanctity and in terms of holiness and total dedication, uh, the religious is really a very, very holy person. I, I found it extraordinary. And the, the meaning of brotherhood really means Christ's brotherhood to people, the availability of brothers to, to the lives of the poorest and the most forgotten ones, which is so needed in the church. It's interesting. Yes. In the United States, or at least in the East, we've always had brothers. Mm -hmm. And brothers, first of all, teaching brothers, uh, Irish Christian brothers, regular Christian brothers, Marists, 
presentation. Uh, President, uh, so I should uh, yes, be yes. careful, start mentioning <laughs> names because we had uh, uh, many brothers, orders uh, of brother, brother, Franciscan brothers of Brooklyn. And uh, so many, many kids went to school with the brothers. And, uh, and that, unfortunately, there's been a decrease in the number of priests and a b even bigger decrease and the number of brothers. And uh, I would really be delighted to see more brothers. In our community, we uh, have a, quite a number of religious brothers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, one of the brothers, uh, Brother Simon, is with me this evening. Great. It's yeah. a, yes. a great thing. Yes. But uh, we'll be coming back in a couple of minutes, and we'll have lots of questions or observations. So please call in, and you don't necessarily have to ask a question, but say something. Don't leave me out here by myself, and I'll have to get Father Andrew to come up with something here. Uh, so we'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> just want to be sure that I give you, and they're going to put it up on the, uh, the uh, television, the, the, uh, the address, Missionaries of the Poor, Box 29893, Atlanta, Georgia, 30359, USA. And so please keep that in mind. Then also, I wanted to mention that we have our broadcast next week, something very interesting. This is 200 years of the anniversary of the birth of St. Don Bosco, wonderful saint of modern times. His order, uh, the Salesians, are the second largest religious order in the world, next to the Jesuits. And uh, my good friend and former student, Father Patrick Angelucci of the Salesians, uh, director of the Salesian High School in New Rochelle, New York, he will be on with me about Don Bosco. Be a very interesting program. And now we have a question from Patty. Where are you from, Patty, and what are you going to tell us? I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, Father, and um, this is a question for Father Richard Holong. Father, uh, I volunteered for a week in October of 2005, and I left four, approximately four days before two of your missionaries were martyred, and I was just wondering what the fruit has been since their deaths. Thank you, and God bless you. Uh, hello, Patty. How are you? <laughs> um, to let you know what happened, the uh, two brothers, Suresh and Marco, they, they were killed. Uh, we didn't know why. We didn't understand. But we had uh, decorative blocks uh, that separated our building from the street. And through the decorative blocks, uh, a gunman shot the brothers as they were doing menial works, they were washing dishes. It was night time, and we had just had a feast to send the brothers away off to Africa. And uh, suddenly the shot came, and one bullet killed two. And uh, we were shocked, horrified. Uh, and yet, at that moment, you had, you, you had a sense that something very sacred was happening. Uh, the blood poured out, and the brothers uh, lifted them up in their arms. And uh, I remember Suresh, he had a, a querulous uh, look in his eyes. 
He didn't seem alarmed, but as if to say, what is happening and why? And then he passed out with a smile on his face. And then Marco, he was shot and uh, he was bewildered. And we saw that there was a possibility that he might live. So we brought him to Kingston Public Hospital, uh, but they were not able to save him. And uh, our immediate response was to begin uh, an e the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament so that the presence of the Lord would be there with them uh, and with us at that moment. And it was beautiful, very reverent, solemn, uh, filled with prayer and, and the presence of God. And uh, the brothers became very, very, very silent. And right through the night, we just prayed together. And uh, next morning, the brother said, we're going down to the centers through the slums. It doesn't matter the fact that the murder lived in the slums with us. We, we will not fear them. So they went through the slums. I went with them and uh, Father Charles. And uh, we showed the people who had, known, uh, who had heard about it, we're not going to run. This is our people. Uh, it is God's will that we be with our people who are the poorest of people. And uh, each center you could see a sense of wonder that they were not being rejected. The poor were not being rejected by the brothers and the priests, but that we were going to stay with them. And they were so deeply moved. Uh, it, it is sort of inexpressible. And uh, the brothers all got a chance to share their grief, and every single one of them said, I would not run. I would stay with this community, and this confirms that this is my vocation. Almost every brother said that. And uh, oddly, vocations beca became to, uh, to really multiply. Father Richard, I yes. have to in yes. introduce, uh, interrupt you, because yes. Our program on the Feast of St. Francis, October 3rd on the evening, is going to be the whole program with you uh, on this subject. Uh, so don't give it all away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to right. another, okay. another subject. So on October 3rd, okay. the eve of St. Francis, yes. we had chosen to speak about okay. the two martyrs. Okay. And uh, I have read what you gave me about it, and it's very, very interesting and it brings to our mind so often in the church what does it mean by martyrs it's very uh, very the word martyr means witness and uh, in the uh, beautiful hymn that we say in latin well, they sing it in English, Holy God, we pray thy name. Yeah. In Latin, it's called the Te Deum. And one of the lines is, Te Martyrum Candidatus Laudat Exercitus. The white-robed army of the martyrs praises you. We have a call now from Lynn. You've been waiting here, Lynn. Where are you from, and what are you going to tell us? Uh, I'm from New York City, from Manhattan. Good for you. Um, thank you. I know it well. Thank you very much, Father Groeschel, for this uh, program with Missionaries of the Poor. I've been watching them sometimes at 6 o'clock in the morning, in the evening, and sometimes I see lay people with them. This is almost a follow-up to the previous question. I want to know um, if Father Holon could describe what a lay person does, how long um, you stay there, the nature of the work, um, things like that. Because I would love to come, but I don't know how to get there and what kind of work you do. Yes, Lynn, I'm going to put you on to Father Charles because he's more in charge of them. Do you mind? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, Lynn, are you there? Oh, yeah, she, she can't answer you now. Uh, okay, uh, well, all you need to do is take an American Airlines to Jamaica. <laughs> and... Um, uh, we will pick you up right at the airport. Uh, it's like a week program we have for Leyte, uh, who come like on a Thursday and leave on Tuesday. And then 
do hands-on work with the with the brothers, uh, dressing the wounds of people who have wounds, or you know, giving medications because the brothers will guide you, feeding those who can't uh, f be fed by themselves, um, and uh, addressing the day-to-day, -day, daily care of those who are homeless, who are uh, have very difficult to just care by themselves. And we have a strong contingent of um, uh, uh, laity who come week after week to live and work with us. One of the beautiful thing about this is you don't only come and work with the poor um, and experience Christ among them, but also you share the life of the brothers. Actually, you would participate in the liturgy of the hours, the daily mass, um, the Meditation. meditations, the adoration, and then lay, lay people come together and form a community there and experience how that is affecting their faith, increasing their, their, their commitment to Christ. And it has been uh, hundreds of people who come, um, mostly from the United States, to share this, uh, this work. And uh, to do that, they got in touch with you by, by missioners of the poor. Uh, missionaries of the missionaries poor. Of the poor. <laughs> I'll all. write it again. Box 29893, Atlanta, Georgia, 30559. And uh, the, uh, I think it would be wonderful if you write me a note and you would like me to send to you one of these brochures. Uh, 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 it tells you about a pilgrimage to Jamaica. And, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Father. They can actually log into um, our website, missionariesofthepoor.org, and there are forms there they can sign up, and there's a telephone number that they can call us, no, where no, they, no. In, and then they can... Say it again. They can log into missionariesofthepoor.org, and there are plenty of information how to get in touch with us to make this journey with us and have us week spent in doing the missionary work among the poorest. So say it again. <laughs> How did, uh, <clears throat> one word, right? Yes. Uh, missionaries of the poor one dot org. It's right. just all, uh, type it uh, without space, missionaries of the poor dot org, and you get there. Isn't that yes. wonderful in modern time? You used to have to look up stuff at the library. You don't have to look <laughs> anything up anymore. Now, uh, do we have another question? We don't have one from our uh, audience on television. How about one here in the, aud aud uh, the audience? Oh, wait a minute. Pat just came up. Okay, Pat, where are you from and what are you going to tell us? I'm from Georgia, Father, oh. and this is for Father Richard. Um, I understand that the missionaries of charity have a the sisters have a male counterpart uh, of, uh, I guess, priests and brothers. And I would like to know, are they similar or identical in terms of their work? And uh, if not, how are they different from that order? Uh, Pat, uh, in our community, we have brothers, but we also have priests living with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a ratio of 10 brothers to one priest. And our priests are called priest brothers because they too have to do the works with the poor. But um, we want the beauty of the liturgy to be part of the life of the brothers. And when priests live with the brothers, you find the word of God is addressed more directly to the works of the brothers and also the men live with the brothers. And so there's a, there, there's a sort of beautiful union between uh, the brothers and the priests so that we become almost like a community that is a, a priestly, peop pe priestly people. And uh, what's very important also, Pat, is the offertory in our liturgy. We emphasize very much the work of human hands that are lifted up by the priest. The, the bread and wine, which represents our lives and our works, lifted up and made sacred through the consecration uh, of the priest. And you feel it, even if you don't really fully understand it intellectually. You feel the presence of the brothers in the actual uh, uh, consecration and, 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 the, and the offering of the sacred mass. The, um, 
the, the brothers of, of the sisters are exclusively brothers. And uh, there are a few, a few priests, and they live separately from the brothers. And I think that makes for a difference. Now, in the Missionaries of Charity, which you were asking uh, about, that's founded by Mother Teresa. Yes. The amazing, many similarities. The Missionaries of Charity play white and blue, and so do the, mm -hmm. the, your, your, your community, Missionaries of the Poor. And the missionaries of charity do very much the same work uh, that my dear friends of mine for many years. But the missionaries of charity also have a men's division. And that was founded by uh, Mother Teresa. And there are uh, a group of missionaries of charity, friar, uh, priests, priests and brothers. Yeah. And yeah. so. Uh, Mother Teresa was going for many years. Uh, I knew her, oh, almost 40 years ago, and it was just getting started, and I met the first priest, and uh, it's grown now to a huge group. We have a call from Monsignor Richard. Now I'm trying to guess out which Monsignor Richard we know. The, we have several. Monsignor Richard, Come and tell us who are you. Hello, Father Benedict. It's Monsignor Richard Figliosi from St. Catherine of Siena in Franklin Square. And hello, Father Holong and Father Charles. Hi, Father. My old student, <laughs> right? Yes. He used to throw spitballs exactly. at me. <laughs> well, yes, Richard, tell me. What well, I met Father Holong about 12, 13 years ago. And I've been bringing groups of people down to Kingston for a long weekend. And I can't uh, emphasize enough how much of a life-changing experience that it is. And uh, this year, we're looking forward to go down again uh, March 2nd to the 7th, and I'll be bringing a group of people. And it's something where each time you go down, you're just surrounded by the love of Christ. And it's the most powerful experience in the world to assist and to be at the side of the brothers and uh, the great joy and peace with which they serve the people. Everyone who I've ever taken down with me comes back a person truly uh, alive with their faith and renewed in, in hope and uh, just uh, very much wanting to be a part of all that the missionaries of the poor do. There was one experience that I had uh, that I would like to relate. I was uh, helping out in the brothers at the Lord's Place, and there was the HIV AIDS section, and there was a man that one of the brothers asked me to help him clean, and at first... I didn't know how I was going to get close enough to this man. I really didn't even want to see him, let alone touch him. And I ended up washing him down in the shower and drying him. And later on in the morning, he would say to me, are you a Catholic priest? And I said, yes. And he says, I just want to let you know how much of a privilege it was for me to be washed with the hands of, by, of a Catholic priest. And it's, it's that type of experience where one's faith is constantly renewed in the, the greatness of those who are poor who have little to give by way of material things, but uh, so spiritually rich. And I just want to say uh, thank you to Father Holong and to Father Charles and to all the brothers for what they've done for me and uh, for many of the people that I've brought down there. And anyone who wants to come, we're going March 2nd to the 7th, and you can contact me at St. Catherine of Siena Parish in Franklin Square, and we'll have you join us in one of these uh, life-changing experiences so full of God's love. Beautiful. Yes, yes, thank you, Father. <laughs> uh, really, Father Richard behaved in class. I, I really, I'm not kidding, <laughs> kidding you about that. Do we have a question from our audience here? Uh, Father Benedict. What countries are you in and which one now? Wait, wait a minute. We've got to get you uh, on a microphone. Which countries are you in and which of these countries has proven to be the most fertile when it comes to vocations? Uh, Philippines has been wonderful. Uh, we, we have a home in Naga City, which is southern part of Luzon, uh, south of Manila. And uh, there, there's a big garbage dump nearby uh, where there really are hundreds of kids and their parents who live there. And we chose that site because of the poverty that w was there. And uh, we built up a, a home to begin with. Uh, just for elderly, homeless people. Then we began to take in children, 
and it became a, a home for about 250 homeless and destitute. Uh, then we started a school for about 200 children, 100 in the morning, 100 in the afternoon. And then we expanded it to food lines and so forth. And uh, again, it's marvelous to see the people who have come to Mass. Um, they just want to be together, all these poor people. And uh, Father Ambrose had a, had a wedding uh, at Easter time this year where he had some 50 people get married at the same time. <laughs> and uh, and uh, out of that situation has come vocations. People who live in the slums, who are um, horse squatters and so forth. And uh, hundreds of youngsters have come to us that way. Then we open a home in Cebu, which is the old capital. And uh, that's really get, getting its, its feet uh, on, on, on ground now. And there's a, a ghetto place called Sarwan Calero, where there's a lot of drugs and guns and so forth. And the brothers position themselves right there. And we're finding a lot of youngsters are now coming to join us there. But also Kenya has been a big source mm -hmm. of other Charles. Kenya. You wanted to mention? Well, we have um, right now about uh, eight missions outside of Jamaica, Haiti. <coughs> Haiti, we have a, a large apostolate and uh, a number of brothers work. And brothers are also attending to great needs in Haiti. And then we have a um, mission also in uh, Kenya and Uganda. Uh, recently, we started in Indonesia. Then we have one in Charlotte uh, here in the United States. And then, uh, yeah. of course, India, we have two missions there. And then Philippines, we have two missions. Well, I thank you both very much mm -hmm. for coming on this mm -hmm. evening. I'm so pleased. And we're going to have another broadcast. We'll be, uh, we're putting it on, re we're recording it, and that will be on, on uh, St. Francis Day, uh, October 3rd in the eve. That will be on the brothers who were murdered, the brothers who are martyrs, and the discussion of martyrdom. May Almighty God bless each one of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I'm going, as I always do, please help EWTN uh, make my good friend Mother Angelica happy. We got to keep the, the wheels changing. And because so many people have difficulties right now financially, I want to ask those who can do it, help us a bit extra, particularly older people who have fixed incomes. They may be able to do better because many people have lost their job or have a part-time job. God bless. We'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.